This show is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Stress shows up in a lot of ways. Teeth grinding, digestive issues, lack of sleep, and more. Sound familiar? Visit betterhelp.com super and find ways to lower your stress. Hey, brother. Okay, I don't know if anybody else had this question after walking out of Secrets of Dumbledore, but I definitely did, which is, why did the chillin' bow to Dumbledore at the end. We all saw him raise Harry as like a pig for slaughter, right? I mean, to be fair, Harry ultimately did have to die, but he had to make sure that he like didn't know that he could come back because it was a big part of it, whatever. But honestly, this little deer has like changed the game and brought to the surface so many new questions. But in case you need the three second refresher on what a chillin is, it is a very rare fantastic beast that has super unique characteristics. One of these is that their spilled blood is actually capable of providing a glimpse into the future, which is both dark and sad. Like, come on Grindelwald, aren't you already a seer? Or are you just like coming up with different ways to do this, including hookah technology? Not the point. The other thing that a chillin can do that is very important to the story is they can look straight into your soul and determine your purity of heart. And in the event that they deem you pure of heart, they have a gesture that they will provide to let you know of that bit of information they will bow. And this creature and gesture are so important to the wizarding world that once upon a time, it is literally how they determined who should be their publicly elected officials. What this does is ensure the fact that leaders are just good people. It's not a bad system, especially when given the fact that politicians are absolutely known for knowing the right things to say, but not always being the best at following through or actually executing those ideas. So for me, I can personally see the appeal here, like knowing that the person who is telling you all of these things wholeheartedly believes in what they're saying. Because at the very least, then it would mean that whatever they ended up doing or not doing had less to do with their actual conviction and maybe just their ability to enact the change. Kind of like a, you didn't actually get it done, but I appreciate the fact that you really did mean you were trying to. All of that being said though, I have always sort of interpreted Dumbledore as someone who did what needed to be done, but also falls into a pretty moral gray area. So I am very curious to get to the bottom of why the chillin bowed to him. Today, we try and break it down. Guys, before we dive on into today's video, we need to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, BetterHelp. It feels like in today's world, burnout is something that is coming up more and more and more often. And I think that it's good that we're recognizing it. For me, it is just the feeling of being anxious, overwhelmed, exhausted, or just generally irritable. And that can just simply be because life can be overwhelming. We tend to associate it with being burnt out at work, but it can happen in any of your roles in life. And if you are living such a busy lifestyle, then BetterHelp Online Therapy can absolutely work for you. I personally have been using BetterHelp and found that the flexibility and ease of scheduling has been amazing. Being able to hop on at different times of day or even just open my laptop when I'm out of town, I can still make my appointments. I would absolutely recommend it if you're getting that burnt out feeling or even if you are because oftentimes you don't even know that you're living inside of that state of being until you're able to take a few steps back. And BetterHelp gives you a variety of options, whether you want to hop on an actual video call, audio call, or even just live chat. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and they do accept HSAs. Plus, you can be matched with your therapist in under 48 hours. And, and our listeners can get 10% off their first month when you head on over to betterhelp.com slash super. Again, that's betterhelp.com slash super for 10% off your first month. Link is in the description down below. Okay, so I will be the first to admit that I don't entirely know how I feel about how the ultimate climactic scene of Secrets of Dumbledore played out. First of all, I absolutely felt like the movie was going to great lengths to let us know that the chillin' was ultimately going to bow before one of our characters. I just really didn't think it was gonna ultimately be Dumbledore. And to be fair, I'm not even sure Dumbledore thought that it would. And I don't necessarily disagree with the outcome. I do absolutely have thoughts on it, but I will come back to that in just a minute. Because thematically, I felt like the movie set up and had a really, really good opportunity to do something marvelous 
with this creature and unfortunately might have missed that opportunity completely. We get the introduction to this beast basically right out of the gate where Newt is in some far flung location in search of a mother chillin who is expecting. Who's not expecting is Newt who is then ambushed by Credence in a gang of Grindelwald's followers. First of all, I felt like this was just really kind of an odd way to go about having all of these characters cross paths because the fact that Newt was uniquely capable of tracking down the creature in the first place felt like something that is very specific to Newt. It doesn't exactly feel like anybody else in the wizarding world should have been capable of finding it. On top of that, they even seem to find it better than Newt did. He had to take a raft to get there. Credence, on the other hand, shows up like right on location. And the explanation that I'm going with here and making absolute headcanon is that they somehow were just tracking Newt and he let him right to it. Dang it, should have just apparated instead of building the awesome raft. Either way, we of course see that the mother is killed, the fawn is taken, and Newt is left injured. But plot twist, there is a twin. What? Second movie in a row where two small specimens are the major plot devices in terms of misdirect? Yes! Credence isn't a Lestrange because the babies were swapped. Good thing that plot line didn't come back at all. Sorry, I feel like I'm getting in the weeds. This is probably gonna happen more than once in this video. Chillins. By the way, did you know that Chillin is spelled Q-I-L-I-N? Because it is. And we're back in the weeds. I told you more was coming. But speaking of plot points that never come back around again at all, one of the big questions that we had leaving the first Fantastic Beast movie was why Dumbledore had instilled just so much faith in Newt. What makes Albus Dumbledore so fond of you? We had no idea, but fortunately in Crimes of Grindelwald, we find out why. Do you know why I admire you, Newt? You do not seek power. You simply ask, is a thing right? And the fact that the Chillin has this unique ability to determine purity felt like a really good way to tell us, the audience, that Dumbledore's assessment of him is correct. Which is what you're telling me now, that Dumbledore is more pure than Newt because I will fight you. Because seriously, if there is a more pure soul in the Fantastic Beast movies than Newt, well then it's of course Jacob. Or at the very least, it really, 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 really felt like this is where the movie was going. After all, a huge portion of what Grindelwald's entire platform is, is to rise up over the muggles so wizards can take their rightful place in things. His words, not mine. But Jacob's involvement in this story has been really great. And I actually think that his character in particular is like the shining bright spot of the entire Secrets of Dumbledore movie. And I also think that they went through some lengths to set up the idea that Jacob might be the one to ultimately get the bow. It all starts at the beginning with Lolly's recruitment of Jacob in the first place. It's almost even like a soft version of the bow. Basically what they're trying to determine is whether or not Jacob is the type of person who will come outside into the dark streets and fight for a complete stranger. And he does exactly that. He puts himself at risk for someone else who he doesn't know. Then there's also this really adorable moment when Jacob meets the chillin for the first time and we're getting a little bit of the backstory as to what it can do. And he like sits down and gives it some of his food and plays with them. On top of that, he is also like the prime representation for non-magical people inside of this series and is essentially the exact opposite of Grindelwald. So if you're Grindelwald or for that matter, just the person who is telling this story, then what better way to cap off the entire story of a man who hates muggles attempting to use a fake chillin to gain power, completely backfire when a real chillin steps onto the scene and bows before, wait for it, a muggle. The exact thing he's fighting against, the non-magical community. The chillin doesn't care what his magical status is. It's case in point proof that this person is good and pure. It's a great reminder to the people of the magical world and a huge blow to Grindelwald's cause. But alas, earwax. Nope. But of course that will bring us to the person that the chillin does bow before. The one, the only, Santos. Wait, who? Over there. Okay, so to be fair, absolutely nothing against Santos. She is the one who like steps in and relieves Jacob of the Cruciatus curse. And she also, oh wait, no, that was all we know about her. Cool, 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 cool. Wait, what? Now, to be fair, I'm not super fussed about this. I'm just not exactly sure why you would introduce a brand new character entirely and not just use like Madame Pickery from the first Fantastic Beast movie. You know, someone who we've 
actually seen in action a little bit and someone who has captured Grindelwald once before. But instead, brand new character who we can now all completely rest assured is in fact pure of heart. Excellent. Either way, it's not really the point. The point is what happens just moments before Santos is determined to be a saint by a small deer. We didn't know a lot about Santos. So that was obviously just, you know, a little bit underwhelming, but a character we know a whole buttload about is one Albus Percival Wolfric Brian Dumbledore. Take that, Santos. We don't even know any of your middle names. That one of them is Patricia. Patty Santos. Goes by her middle name. The chill and balance before Dumbledore though was big to me for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is the fact that Dumbledore himself continues through the rest of his life not believing that he himself is pure of heart. He holds himself responsible for being tempted by power and says the following. It is a curious thing, Harry, but perhaps those who are best suited to power are those who have never sought it. Those who, like you, have leadership thrust upon them and take up the mantle because they must and find to their own surprise that they wear it well. I've always read this as if Dumbledore is absolutely comparing Harry in contrast two characteristics of himself. And I guess what I'm ultimately curious to discover is whether or not Dumbledore is just unaware of the fact that this is also true about himself. And the obvious argument against this very thought is the fact that Grindelwald's mantra is for the greater good, a sentiment typically shared by villains. Essentially, it's a cause harm for the overall good. But how is this ultimately that much different from all of the rigor that Dumbledore subjects Harry to during his years at Hogwarts? He's making him slowly unravel the truth on his own, all so that when the moment comes, he is willing to accept death. One boy's life in exchange for taking down the Dark Lord still feels pretty greater goodish. Either way, there are some other details to discuss about this piece of knowledge. The chillin' when it kneels before Santos is effectively electing her to the position of Supreme Mugwump, or as I like to call it, Supreme Ruler of the Wizards. And the entire plot of this movie is Grindelwald literally trying to take over this position because it would then put him in charge of the entire wizarding world. Like, it's a huge freaking deal. And yet, one of the very first things that we ever learn about Albus Dumbledore on his letter to Harry on his invitation to Hogwarts is, Headmaster Albus Dumbledore, Order of Merlin, First Class, Grand Sorcerer, Chief Warlock, Supreme Mugwomp, International Confederation of Wizards. So turned down the position of Minister for Magic on three separate occasions, just took the position that that position reports to. Hardly power, I'm just basically the king of wizards. Starting to sound an awful lot like Cornelius Fudge there, Dumbledore. That's not a good thing. Either way, here's what I think we can begin to interpret with this piece of information. The scene with the chillin is probably ultimately what qualifies Dumbledore for this position in the first place. A position that we see he actually refuses in this exact scene. And if the day ever does arise where Santos does need to step down from this particular role, it could be the case that someone much more dangerous is on the precipice of accepting it. In this event, Dumbledore accepting the position at that point in time would be a very similar situation to what he is explaining to Harry. Power is being thrust upon him. Because again, Harry never sought out power or leadership. It just kept needing to be him to lead the charge. So if he ultimately does accept this position and is in fact still holding this position as of Harry's first year at school, then some questions start to arise as to like how Dumbledore just couldn't simply override Fudge on any of the decisions that we see him making during Harry's time at school, like specifically in Order of the Phoenix, where he's literally fighting tooth and nail with Fudge to get him to see reason. But he is Supreme Mugwump, right? Can't he just overrule him? Didn't Grindelwald temporarily get elected as the new leader of the magical world? Why doesn't Dumbledore have more power here? Here's what I am inclined to believe happened. Dumbledore does not trust himself with power, even though he has been assured by the chillin that he is pure of heart. So if this position ultimately is offered before him, and if he doesn't take it, it means that someone much more dangerous will, then the accepting of that position is probably more a protecting power than seizing it. Beyond that, his inability to override Fudge during Harry's years at school could just have literally been his first act 
as Supreme Mugwump. Essentially, he would finally accept the office, but then immediately downgrade his own power. An act that would make this position more of a figurehead kind of position rather than something that does hold power. And it would also then prevent another person from ever attempting to weaponize this exact position, which is pretty much what Grindelwald spent the entire movie trying to do. And it would also explain that despite holding such a prestigious position during Harry's time at school, that Dumbledore nor anyone else who could be holding this doesn't have any more sway over the ministry. And it would once again bring us back to Dumbledore's own line. Perhaps those who are best suited for power are those who have never sought it. Those who like you have leadership thrust upon them and take up the mantle because they must and find to their own surprise that they wear it well. If all of this is true, then what it would mean is that Dumbledore, who is someone who sought power as a young man, turned into someone who ultimately became a great leader through a lifetime of not seeking power. What this means for the chillin', at least for me, is that Dumbledore absolutely in his heart does not want to seek out power ever again. Ironically, this is the thing that makes him a perfect fit. So it almost seems like what the Chillin is really doing is determining purity of heart based on someone who deserves power, deserves it, but does not seek it. And whoever that is, is the one who gets it. And in Dumbledore's case, we know that he goes on to be a leader in a massive number of different ways, not only holding this very position, but he's also chief warlock of the Wizard Magot. He's the headmaster at one of the most prestigious wizarding schools in the entire wizarding world. And the leader of the Legion of the Order of the Phoenix twice. Plus, if we're being super real about it, the captain of his bowling team. But the point is, just because he didn't seek it out, doesn't mean it wasn't thrust upon him. But guys, for my question of the day, is there anyone else that you would love to see the chillin' bow before? Who else do you think could serve as a candidate within the wizarding world? Let me know in the towel section down below. But guys, as always, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. If you'd like to find out another theory we have about what the chillins could be capable of, you can check out this video right over here. But otherwise, until next time, bye.